Hello, friends. Welcome to Nexus, a smart buildings technology podcast for smart humans. I'm your host, James Dice. If we haven't met before, I write a weekly newsletter on this same topic. It's also called Nexus. Each week, I share what I've learned, my opinions, and what I'm excited about in the quickly evolving world of intelligent buildings. Readers have called Nexus the best way to stay up to date on the future of this industry without all the marketing fluff. You can check it out and subscribe at nexus.substack.com or click the link in the show notes. Since starting the Nexus newsletter, many of you have reached out to me wanting to talk shop, and we have. After a few weeks of those wonderful conversations, I realized I needed to record and share them with our growing community. So here we are. The Nexus podcast is born. This is our chance to explore and learn with the brightest in our industry together. All right, episode 28 is another conversation with Joe Gaspardoni, COO of Montgomery Technologies. This time, Joe and I dove deep into commercial real estate finance 101. Before you think that doesn't apply to you and turn off the episode, let me tell you, I think you're probably wrong about that. If you're interested in smart buildings, the business case for that solution or technology needs to be made at some point. And this episode will show you what it takes to actually do that for one type of building, the commercial office building. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Nexus Pro. Nexus Pro is an annual or monthly subscription where members get exclusive writing, podcasts, and an invite to a monthly members-only event. You can find info on how to join and support the podcast at nexus.substack.com. This episode is also brought to you by Nexus Foundations, an introductory course on smart buildings. If you're new to the industry, this course is for you. If you're an industry vet but want to understand how technology is changing things, this course is also for you. Cohort 2 is set to kick off in winter 2021, and you can enroll at courses.nexuslabs.online. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the Nexus podcast. All right, Joe, welcome back to the show. In case anyone didn't listen to the last episode, can you go ahead and introduce yourself one last time? Sure thing. Joe Gasperdoni, COO of Montgomery Technologies. Montgomery has uh, got two, two divisions to it. It's uh, riser management, which we call the old business. It's 18 years old. And then we've got intelligent riser, which is really the assessment, design, and installation of secure networks in buildings, dedicated building networks, and that's the new business, which is actually now 10 years old, so it doesn't sound so new. Right, right. And if you go to the last episode of uh, the podcast, we dove into that whole side of the that whole business, really. So today we're going to talk a little bit about commercial real estate finance. And you have strong opinions in this matter. And so I, I thought it'd be good to bring you on and let you share those strong opinions I want to share my strong opinion to begin with here. So yeah. developing the Nexus Foundations course, introductory course on smart buildings. And this week happens to be the week where we're talking about making the business case for uh, smart building technology. And what I've found is that I'm very underwhelmed by not just the existing content out there on this topic. Like, you know, there's a lot of blog posts, yeah. a lot of guides, a lot of reports, a lot of white papers. Here's how you make the business case for smart building technology. And I'm just very underwhelmed by it because I don't feel like people are talking about how in the real world, you could be trying to sell something. You could be, you know, the internal champion trying to get a project to move forward. You could be the one trying to create a program, right? Yeah. For smart building technology in your portfolio. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that you actually have to get really specific to make the business case, right? You have right. to understand the business that you're in or the business that you're selling to. And my problem with everything I've seen is that it's a lot of fluff. Yeah. It's, it's just a ton of not only marketing fluff, but also just like ROI fluff. Like the ROI has a lot of issues with it, the way it's calculated in most cases. So this conversation then, because it requires specificity, it depends on what business you're selling into or the business that you're talking about. Sure. So a lot of this conversation is going to be focused on CRE, but I think this kind of mindset applies to whether you're selling to healthcare or retail or data centers or, or whatever, you have to get to this level of specificity to be able to make the business case. And so 
You have several lessons here that we're going to kind of like rapid fire through and yeah. I'll let you kind of lead the conversation and I'll interject questions as we go. So floor is all yours. All right. Well, this is uh, to me, this is like one of the ultimate high bars because I can imagine so many people out there right now saying, really, you're going to talk about finance? Like, no, no. Yeah. Don't like, turn it off. Wait, do wait. <laughs> How can you do that on a podcast? It doesn't even, it's not even possible. I need a spreadsheet. But no, what we want to try to do is really just cover, you know, with broad brush strokes, we want to cover some of the basics of real estate finance and commercial real estate 101. Because this is to me always been, it's just amazing that this is how it has played out. But, you know, in any other industry I've ever been in, when someone comes to sell you something, they're selling you something knowing what you do and how it will interface, interact with what you do. And this is the only industry I've ever been in where literally hundreds of people over the years will come in to sell something and not even know like the vocabulary of the people they're selling to. And so it's those two trains in the night, you know, you're saying something and they have no idea what you're talking about, but more importantly, you're not speaking their language. So you're telling them you're not an expert in their business. And so the, the goal of this is really to cover the basics around vocabulary and meaning, because even if you walk away with like six things, you're going to be able to be far more effective when you communicate. And that's something we put all our people, everybody in our organization goes through heavy, intensive kind of practice vocabulary training because once it's in here you're able to use it and we can use it fluently without saying a single word you can tell somebody i know your business i also understand what it is you have to do so okay. that's the first thing so we're going to talk about um the place i love to start is something i've been like pontificating about now for a while which is you must know that this market is not you know, the model that you created and you're getting funded on is not CRE. It's two markets and they're very different. Mm. And I, this is what I call them. I call them transactional and non-transactional. Lesson one is there are two markets, transactional and non-transactional. Transactional buildings are the buildings that are going to probably sell in the next three to seven years. That's the vast majority. I call it a kind of a twist on the 80-20 rule. The 20 is the non-transactional buildings, the college campuses, the Amazon campuses, Microsoft campuses, these kinds of buildings that don't have the same bottom line value component. So the 20, if you get in with the 20, you refine your technology, you get the cost down to a point, then you can enter the 80. So it does fit the sort of idea of the 80-20 rule, but it just sort of twists it a little yeah. bit. Uh -huh. and, and so, the transactional side of the business is the majority component. And that is not where you start with technology. That's me, my opinion speaking, but I mean, you're, you'd be crazy to try to start on the transaction side because every dollar has a 15 to 20 multiplier on it in terms of the cost sensitivity. So why would you ever start? You wouldn't start there because it's too hard when you're developing something you got to get it to scale first and then bring the cost down and then come into the cost sensitive side. So a lot of people out there that I've talked to through Nexus, a lot of the solutions I've heard on the podcast are super smart. They're going right to that part of the business and they're going, I'm going to go and I'm going to get this right. And it's going to be with people who are willing to walk this road with me and don't have to have every dollar come out in a net operating income fashion. They don't have the same sensitivity. And the other place to go, and a lot of smart people are going there too, is New York. Because New York's got the Climate Mobilization Act. And in 2023, which is right around the corner, they're gonna either have to start writing checks or they're gonna have to start implementing these solutions. So those are your two markets where you can go and there's gonna be less cost sensitivity for different reasons. And that, how do I figure out? Is the only teeny tiny slice of the bigger market. And so if yeah. your business case doesn't tell the story that it's really going to be like five years before you can really enter the right. big part of the market, then that's where the, there's a lot of finessing going on there. Got it. And, and if I'm 
trying to wrap my head around this concept. How do I figure out whether a given real estate organization is in either bucket? Yeah, great question. The ownership really rules the roost, right? So if the ownership of a building is Microsoft, then you don't have that. If the ownership is a college campus, if the owner is the college, you don't have that. So ownership drives that. If the ownership is a teacher's union, you have a very cost sensitive building. You know, any kind of investor relationship is going to mean you're, you're right in the, the transactional side and every dollar has a significance in terms of value. But there are exceptions and I'm sure people will point that out. You know, you get long-term ownership they're not looking to sell. Um, those exist. It's just that they're a minority of the business. So in this big, broad brushstroke world, 80-20 rule, start at the 20, make your way to the 80 after you've gotten scale. Got it. Got it. All right, cool. Great. So let's keep going. Now, yeah. So my third lesson, that was second lesson is, you know, start there. Third lesson is I'm going to prove that the 80% is transactional because the rest of all of these lessons are going to be about the transactional side. Mm, that is okay. lesson three. Everything else we cover here is going to be based on transactional business. So the non-transaction is not included in the rest of this. Mm -hmm. So the next one, cap rate. It's the least used, most important term in the technology space because mm -hmm. a lot of people just don't understand exactly what it means. And if you You've have referenced it already here, uh, you almost I, can't help yourself. But before you I explained can't. it, you already referenced it. <laughs> I didn't even realize it. I, I just I can't help it because it's like every building, the first question out of, if you're looking at acquiring a building, it's like, well, what's the cap rate? Because it gives you an instant barometer, benchmark of what you're talking about. I know if something is a five cap, I know that it's like a super solid building. It's not gonna have a huge return, but it's like, that's a strong building. I know an eight cap has got something wrong. There's hair in there somewhere. Um, mm. Maybe it's vacant you need a value add. Maybe there's, you know, there's something there. The cap rate is this instant barometer that gives you a quick understanding. The lower the cap rate, essentially, the better the building, location, quality, whatever is driving mm. that. And what it means is what the cap rate is, is just this. It's the net spendable income. So you got income, you got expenses, you got this number before you pay debt, before you pay interest. So it's the net operating income pre-debt payments. Okay. So that basically tells you, hey, I've got this amount of money after expenses and you know, rent expenses, and this is what it is. It's that number divided by the purchase price, by the price of the building. So okay. it's telling you, you know, if you've got a big net operating income and a small purchase price, well, the first thing you say is, well, why am I getting such a good deal, right? Mm, okay. That's the idea, this is the relationship. And then the reverse of that is, is I've got a little teeny amount and this really big purchase price, I'm like, why is it so small? Oh, because it's class A and it's right on public transportation. The walk score is 99. You know, that's mm. why. So the cap rate is not being able to use that in a sales pitch is a mistake. Because mm. when you can say that word and throw it in, you're able to tell the receiving audience, I know your business. Because that's just a thing that gets thrown around all the time. Now, the other piece of it... <laughs> And the dark side of the sort of cap rate is it creates, it is really the barometer of the sensitivity of that building. Mm. So if you think about it, it's a percentage, right? If I have $5,000 as the net income and I have $100,000 as the purchase price, that's a 5% relationship. Okay. But what it really means in our world in technology is that every dollar that I'm asking that person to spend that's going to come out of net operating income, you're going to reduce it, is going to affect value by 20 times that dollar. 20. So if I reduce $1 out of that NOI of 5,000 and it's $49.99, I've literally just affected the value of the building by $20. So now if you have that sitting up here, all of a sudden you're like, hey, the solution is just 10 grand a month. It's like, Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. 10 grand for the year, which is 120. And then you've got to multiply that by 20. 
Right. So you're talking two and a half million dollars of value. So now you're asking me to give up a financeable two and a half million dollars for your solution. Now, how does that sound when you realize what the audience is doing in their mind? So that's totally. just a critical, yep. critical. You have to have a way to think of that, talk to it, address it in some way. You know, and it can't be like, oh, we're going to increase the value of your building. Well, that's that's a, that's not a thing. You can't just say that. <laughs> so. Right. And I see a lot of this pop up with like, say, a smart building software solution. They might say it's 10 cents a square foot. Right. Yeah. So when you when you hear me say 10 cents a square foot for your SAS fee, what do you think about? I'm like, oh, here you go. You're right over here with all these guys, these software guys. They have no idea what they're saying. That's mm -hmm. never proven true. I can't quantify that. It's just like that is the soft stuff that gets you put on this list over here, like a thousand vendors that are all trying to sell. These buildings have mid-sized company spend, you know, every year. So you know how many people are selling them solutions of mm -hmm. every conceivable kind. So the first thing you want to do is not be put over there. And the way you don't get put over there is you speak to these things, even if they don't help sell directly they are helping sell directly because they're letting the person know i understand your business i'm not going to sell you 10 cents a square foot because that's not really a thing it hasn't been proven out and our industry doesn't see that that way so hmm. okay cool so let's see i think this would be like lesson five maybe so that the piece that we've talked all around that go back write it on paper if you have to but like really understand that because it's it's just so fundamental the next step of that, I always call this the how to get rich quick in real estate step, is leverage, the power of leverage. So if I don't have a loan on a building and I have, let's just take the simple numbers, I'm going to get $5,000 a year on $100,000. That's like if I had my $100,000 in the bank, I'd be getting 5%, which is $5,000 coming in. Okay, but what if... I don't have $100,000 in. What if I only have $30,000 in and I pay a loan payment on that 70, right? So now I only have 30,000 in this and my $5,000 drops, it drops to like three. But what did that just do? I only have 30 grand in and now I'm getting $3,000 a month. That's a 10% return. I literally <laughs> doubled that by getting the loan structure in place. So the power of leverage is if you get it right, you can really boost your returns and not be like hung over your skis and lose everything if the market turns. But mm. that's the boom and bust of leverage. That's why you see you know, people getting rich quick in real estate and losing everything in real estate. Because it. it always goes back to leverage. The people who are leveraged right, they beat the market. They, they have a good path for long-term success. The people who, you know, push the envelope and put 10% down and it looks like, oh my God, I'm getting 25% on my money. Well, when the market sours and if they have to refinance or they're stuck, they have to sell, they lose everything. So wow. that's the bust side of it is the less you have in, the more subjected you are to the cycle, the market cycle. So you can lose everything. Um, and how do I figure out where the building owner is in that? process because that it, it, that needs to affect how i'm proposing what totally to do can, right? totally can affect how you're proposing if it's a transactional building you're going to have leverage that is always i mean almost always except for long ownership but these buildings that sell every three to seven years they're always within a 50 to 70 percent debt to equity ratio always mm. um, and most often it's even tighter it's like 60 to 70 so they're putting enough in where they can outlast any kind of market cycle, but they're not you know, going out and getting a second loan to get really high up in the leverage stack. You don't want that. It just becomes a big risk. So the generally accepted debt to equity as a start point when you buy a building, is usually 60 to 70 percent. So it's in that window. Okay. So the boom cycle is, hey, if I got in with 10 percent and I added over time you know, $10 million of value, and I only had a million dollars in while well, I just literally exponentially grew. And when I exit, I made 10 X my money. So mm. that's the, the boom side of the leverage equation. Got it. Okay. So, 
The, um, the next piece of this, so we talked about sort of cash on cash return, right? So you got a hundred thousand dollars in something, you're getting five grand, it's 5%. Not particularly exciting. But then we talked about the appreciation aspect over time of a building. So if I have that hundred thousand and five years later, rents have gone up and all of a sudden that hundred thousand is worth, you know, 150 or 170,000. Well, when you sell that building, that's a real factor of your return. That's uh, if it's 70 grand, it's 70% over five years. So you have this additional aspect to the return, which is appreciation of the asset, which is why some buildings are willing to invest in technology and leverage, raise the profile, get Google in as a tenant, and you've just made a fortune on that building. When you have Google as a tenant, you're the gold standard. And before, when you had, you know, such and such finance or insurance company, you're, you're not that you've been incredibly enhanced the building when you pull somebody like that. So technology can directly benefit the building. Google's requirements now, we deal with them a lot. And when they're taking six floors of a building, they have all kinds of requirements for control over BMS in their space. Lots of fancy bells and whistles. And a big one is security. They have security requirements that extend out of the building, out into the common areas. It's a huge piece of sort of what they require when they go in. So there are ways to do it and to bring in, you know, a real credit tenant like that. <laughs> but when we go back to the idea of the return, you've got a second piece of the return, you know, or really it's a third piece. You've got the cash on cash return, like the bank return. Then you've got the appreciation return. There's another one, and this is really the cherry on top and why people always see these guys who've been in real estate for 20 years and they're worth like millions of dollars and they don't seem to really done a lot. And this is really why every building, if you just take a $10 million building, 75% of that 10 million is what they call the asset value, the depreciable asset value. So $750,000 is going to get chopped up over 39 years. This is the IRS rules. And that number is a direct write-off to your income every single year. Mm -hmm. So suddenly my 5% return in the case that, you know, that I laid out on this sort of simple spreadsheet, my 5% is not 5% at all. It's 8.5%. So it's had a 3.5% bump or like in the other world, it's gone up like 60% because I have this depreciation that is allowing me to shelter, you know, if your tax rate's 40%, you're literally getting 40% more money than you otherwise would have. Wow. So that depreciation aspect of real estate is why buildings sell on a regular basis. Because after a period of time, people want to trade up and get a higher level of return and depreciation. And the way the tax laws are structured, you always have to buy equal to or greater than. So there's this uh. constant trading up the chain. It's why you see like recently in San Francisco, we saw this cool building that we work with, the entity traded out of that and then just bought a massive Amazon tower with that equity. And they reset their depreciation schedule and they got this massive new number and now with Amazon revenue, they can shelter a huge piece of that bottom line revenue. Hmm. So when you factor in the cash on cash return with the depreciation return, the sheltered income, the after tax equivalent, right? And then you add in the appreciation, like some kind of straight line appreciation of value. It's very common for these buildings to easily get into high double digits if times are good or low double digits in normal times. I mean, 18%, that really happens a lot. In boom times, 40%, absolutely. I mean, people in this last run up have made incredible amounts of money and they often have a hard time to find what to buy next because the market for a long time was so hot. Hmm. So that's really what I probably would call the big picture of the ROI because okay. all three of those are components and they lead to an ROI that's really a lot higher than people realize. Wow, okay. I know that was a lot, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't say sorry. Um, is that all the lessons you were planning on going uh, through? I got one more for you. 
or really. I got a bunch of questions, but I'll let you get through your. Yeah, your I'll, get, I'll hit you with this one. And this is what I call the dark side of cam charges. Um, okay. A lot of people, when you Google, you know, cam chart, the buzzword is split incentives, right? Because you've got mm. the building who's passing their costs to the tenant. Yep. And from a purely financial standpoint, that seems like a fine setup. Like you occupy this much space, you're going to pay this much of the total. It all works out and it's great. But now we're seeing that dark side. And that is that the building really does not have an incentive to upgrade to put submetering in, you know, really only New York has a full-fledged system when there's a TI, the submetering is commissioned for that space and it gets put in as part of the TI. And mm -hmm. that's really the only place that they do that, like lockstep with anything that gets added. Right. But the rest of the market's like, well, why would I ever spend half a million dollars doing that? I'm already recouping my pro rata. Nobody's asking me to, and nobody's making me. Mm -hmm. So. The dark side of that, that damn camp charge is the fact that there's no incentive for the building. Altruism alone is not going to do it. Right. Um, the betterment of the world is just not going to do it. So I think we're looking at, as, as much as I hate to say it, I just think we're, we're looking at a world where until legislatively, you got to get off your butt and do it. I just, I can't see really how that happens otherwise because these goals are just so not in alignment so that's the dark yeah. side and it shows up with energy efficiency all the time like why would the tenant care when if they're going to pay for some sort of energy efficiency improvement it just barely benefits them benefits the whole building right but they're paying for right exactly. so there's all these types of I mean, energy engineers call them split incentives. Do you think that's a bad word uh, for, <laughs> well, for the real estate was, industry? Yeah. Here's what I would say about it. If you were talking to anybody on the operation side and you said split incentives, they'd either politely nod their head and not know what you're talking about, mm. or they might know what you're talking about, but then they'd say, see, this guy doesn't even understand what I'm talking They don't Got understand it. my business. Well, what does I CAM stand for? CAM charges. My business is CAM charges, common area maintenance charges. That's what my world is. Every year, I have to scoop up all of those charges for everything that's related. I have to amortize some CapEx and push that into the complex spreadsheet that mm -hmm. I have to reconcile and then give each tenant their detailed reconciliation of what they paid versus what actually was uh, incurred. So yeah. that, that is the CAM charge world. The split incentives kind of describes the problem and that's a, an apt description. But if you're in any meeting and you say the word split incentives, it better be a meeting of tech people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The terminology is super important. There's a ton of terms that we could maybe hit at the end. Yeah. Maybe come up with a glossary at some point. You can pass it out. Mm -hmm. Cool. Be um, last thing. And we kind of touched on it. So I'll keep it super short, but uh, the last lesson is, for 80% or more of the market, value, the overriding principle of value is the net income, and, and in some cases really the net spendable, so after I pay my debt, what's left after that. The net income or net spendable numbers relative to the amount of money I've invested in this building. Those two, that relationship or the purchase price is another way of saying it. So I'm going to sell this building in seven years. So if I sign up for a long-term solution that's going to cost me recurring dollars, I have to be thinking about that. If I'm going to lose $5 million of value, I have to think about how am I going to get that back because I'm going to sell this building in five years. I can't just give it up because that's a real $5 million, right? So that the fundamental principle of value is it's predicated on the fact that I'm going to exit this deal at some point in the relative near future. And therefore I must understand what I'm spending and why and whether I'm gonna get it back before I sell. So and that requires you to trace the, so a lot of times people have spreadsheets. I know you have one just to illustrate this, but you're tracing your operating expenses through to your net operating income. And then from that to using your cap rate to your, the value of the, the building. Because right? That's what the next guy is going to use to look at it and analyze it and then finance it. And mm. I'll leave you, this is a great concept. Imagine if you could keep your expenses exactly flat for five years 
and your leases all have three or four percent increases in them. That alone, just letting that play out and keeping this flat, that generates like a 30 to 40 percent return over the five years. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the tremendous pressure on a building to flatten that expense side out because yeah. the lease rates are going up, the financing is fixed rate. So there's the only thing that's changing is if, you, if I can keep these expenses as flat as possible, I'm gonna make a lot of money on this building. So that's the pressure, that's the uphill battle that we all face. And the more we can connect real ROI, it has to be real, but if it even can be at the margins real, like I'm gonna save you a little on your insurance from leak detection, like that totally works. It's, it's working, people are rolling that out across the country. You just have to find that strategy. You know, B BMS has got a great model for that, but you got the split incentive issue, the cam charge issue. And so mm -hmm. that's the battle that has to be fought. And that's the world we're in. I don't shoot the messenger. It's just like, that's the reality of, yeah. those are the pressures facing the operational side. Got it. And now that we have sort of yeah. like laid yeah. out these lessons, let's bring it down to the ground for the technology companies out there. So I want to start with just like defining NOI. So I'm continually amazed by how many people yeah. haven't heard of this term, net operating income. Can you like put it back yeah. into the context of these lessons? God, it's so true. I, I mean, and that's the thing, right? There are probably 20 and you don't want to like kill everybody in one podcast, but that's why these terms and knowing them and being able to fluidly use them is so important. So net operating income, there are really two. One is really simple. It's the revenue of the building minus the expenses of the building, not including like CapEx, one-time expenses. It's really looking at what is the recurring revenue of the building minus the recurring expenses of the building. Mm -hmm. That is the baseline NOI pre-debt, pre-debt. So then the second version of NOI is now I made interest payments. So I'm going to throw those interest payments in as a line and I'm going to look at my net operating income inclusive of debt. Mm -hmm. And so very often people are looking at both of those for different reasons because obviously financing can be a factor that, you know, if I can get a better rate than you can, I'm going to pay more for that building, right? So it affects the value. Right. So you've got NOI pre-debt and then NOI, NOI, which is sort of including the interest payments on the debt. Yeah. So that's net operating income. So when you say those words, you can know in your head, it's just revenue minus expenses at the fundamental level debt is really an expense right so you're paying that so it's just revenue minus expenses that's net operating income and and what i've heard from you before is one of the ways that companies mess up is they might say we're going to increase your rent revenue right and how is that like a, a no-no in your mind yeah so you would have to you know because that I would mean, increase the noi that would be one of the oh, ways yeah, yeah. to create value totally and look when we're selling strategies to the transactional market you must address increasing revenue or decreasing expenses somehow it cannot mm -hmm. be left in the tenant satisfaction realm because it's just not enough to move it forward so yes if you ever say we're going to increase your revenue or your rent per square foot by x i've yet to see somebody throw a like bona fide way they do that it, it tends to get very soft and squishy very fast and you if you could be in my head and see the hundreds of presentations where people said they're going to increase my rent per square foot by a dollar fifty, two dollars, thirty cents. It's like you know my rent per square foot would be like five thousand dollars a month now. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, or five thousand dollars square foot. So I would stay away from that because it really doesn't have a provable metric behind it, and it puts you in the long list of others who have gone down that road. If you've got a way that actually, you know, the expense side's a lot easier for people to prove out, right? If I have a utility bill and there's my baseline and I see it go down year over year, that's real. I can quantify that. If you tell me I'm gonna take these six internet circuits and make it two, I can quantify that. So there are ways you can get your solution in. Um, you know, we talked about leak detection. If you tell me I'm going to get a 5% reduction on my insurance premium by putting this solution in and I go and verify that with my insurance company, door is open, right? right. So right. it's just finding the way. It's very difficult on that side of the business. 
you mentioned tenant experience. That leads me into my next question. So yeah. I'm reading the book Healthy Buildings right now, which is like a very popular book to be reading right now during the time of the oh. coronavirus. It's almost like a little uh, scary how they released it like right before the, yeah, the pandemic yeah. hit. A little bit scary. But so this ties into sort of JLL's 330-300 rule where the 300 bucket is basically saying like the main cost of a business is the salaries paid to um, employees, which are the tenants of office buildings, right? So how do you think about when people make ROI claims around that 300 bucket, which is a little bit fluffy, right? I, 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 I really do feel badly saying it, but people need to know like if anybody is on the operational side and you're pushing that, it's just not a good place to go. It can be true fundamentally, but it just doesn't translate in real dollars and cents the way that everybody on the operational side thinks about that piece of it. So I'll give you a good example. And it ties into your healthy buildings book. So there's a wave of buildings are out there. Owner, ownership, management companies are trying to find, you know, healthy building solutions so that people can come back. That's, yeah. there's a giant wave of this that's about to get funded across the country. So everybody's looking at technologies and what are they doing? Again, don't shoot the messenger, but we're living it. They're solving for the lowest requirement. So they're not trying to do it holistically by and large. I know there are exceptions. Yeah. Please don't pepper me with them, I know. But I'm just talking about like the 80 or 90% of the market they find a plasma solution that can be put on each air handler. It's $15,000 per air handler and it's whatever times 20. So we're looking at $300,000 solution. That's it done. We've got a healthy building. We're going to tell everybody that we've done it. It meets all the requirements that the, the city and County have laid out and done. done. Our wow, UV lighting, we got UV lighting, it's gonna cost this much per, it goes here, and okay, it's a $200,000 solution, checks all the boxes, done. That's, I, I, you know, that's yeah. what's happening. So it's not ideal. Wow. Well, I think back on the 330, 300, I think where it breaks down is like the 300 is talking about the, the tenant, yep. right? and the tenant's business, right? And yep. making the tenant's business revenue higher. But where so it gets tell you stuck that, is like, there's two yes. different stakeholders here. Yes, right? and, and let me tell you how that came across. This is one of the well-known institutional investors. I just talked to him in this last week. And when we were talking about this, his response was the tenant space is the tenant space. It's their premises, they pay for that you know, whatever they're going to install is going to be their solution for their space. My responsibility is this common area space and anything I'm delivering, i.e. air quality into the tenant space. And so my responsibilities are here. And I, I had a hard time arguing. I mean, at the fundamental level, it's not ideal, but that is really how these leases are written. So it's a very, God, I don't want to say disheartening, but it's, it's like, you're left with, you know, health scanners and touchless tech is coming in. So you don't have to touch elevators. So all of those to some degree are being explored and will be implemented, but it's a little bit of a bummer that there's not a bigger awareness as to, Hey, what can be done here more holistically. And yeah. from all the lessons we've laid out here, what is this plasma, you know, band-aid basically what is that a symptom of which one of the lessons what what's causing the the owner it's, to do that it's right it goes right back to cap rate i mean okay. it, it is a one-time cost so you can kind of write it off as that but all of those have some recurring component to them you know everything does now right mm -hmm. so the plasma solution on the air handler will make clean healthy air at a standard that meets or exceeds the requirements but it's just that's the solution for this problem and therefore I met that and I've built in whatever little additional cost over time is going to be plugged in there. And so my value is preserved and that's the bummer Got because it. you would like them to say, well, actually just do this a little bit more. But then as soon as you do that, you're like, well, I just gave up $2 million of value. I, when mm. I sell this in three years, you just are having me write a check for $2 million out of my pocket because that was real money that I gave up. So that's the battle. That's the battle. It's the ultimate struggle. 
the encouraging thing, people out there, I promise you, is if you crack this, you're good. You're good for the long, long haul. Once you're in, it's almost like an annuity. You will be there forever if you don't mess it up. So mm -hmm. that's the great side of coming through the tunnel is once you come through that tunnel, you can do it and you will do it and people will come to you. The sheep will follow and they will all come to you. You can so do it over and over again. It's just cracking that one is tough. So I got two more questions. We want these lessons to be kind of long-term lessons, but while we're on the COVID, uh, you see a lot of announcements on, you know, Deloitte is reducing their offices. So how does that then hit the landlord's business and so, how do you recommend people start to talk to their landlords then when they have these decreasing tenancy going on? The reason, the fundamental reason why buildings are going to spend money period is twofold. It's to get the building to a healthy standard, but it's also, and the main driver and everybody's experiencing this moment of terror is that, that what if they don't come back? So money is having to be spent in ways to make that space healthy and message healthiness and comfort. So that is an opportunity. I mean, the opportunity is there and the money is going to be spent, whether it's going to be spent the way we would love it to be spent or not. It's really almost secondary. The money is going to get spent because it has to be spent because this is a sort of one-time shot to make people feel comfortable to come back to the office. And if you believe that there's one or more vaccines coming and that that gets distributed through the spring and then people kind of feel like, oh, okay. And then the summer sort of bumps along, maybe occupancy rates rise a little bit. And then I would say by August of next year, for sure, like when school starts, parents are going to be like, well, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I got to go back. But how they go back and how often is really where the buildings are right now. How do I entice them, you know, without breaking the bank? What can I do and say and message to bring those people back? But I will predict it. I, I'm going to predict that by um, August of next year, we're back to 80 to 90% occupancy. If, you know, if we had a baseline mm -hmm. at what existed pre-COVID, there'll be about 10%, 15% that are going to do a longer term experiment with work from home and rotating and but I think people have short memories and you know when things sort of settle back in and a few months have passed and they can go back and feel comfortable I think that's probably going to happen in mass got it okay I lied I actually have two more questions so one of them is around um, I think a lot of these transactional buildings people will when they when they go in and they, they start to make the business case they're also going to run into someone besides the owner which is the property manager so jll christian wakefield cbre you know whoever else a bunch of different companies around the world how do they sort of play into this without a whole another set of lessons <laughs> yeah no you know another really hard aspect to a sale you know everybody always jokes about the 18 month sales cycle or three-year sales cycle and that is real. And that's why you have to have hundreds more prospects in the pipeline than you would in another industry because they fall at such a longer mm -hmm. timeline. And one of the reasons for it is different people in different organizations have basically veto power. It's a very disaggregated decision tree. So you can have, like we talked about, CTOs will have kind of a position but a lot of times that position is to stamp an approval on a plan, but then the property manager has ultimate veto and they don't have the money. And so they're not gonna spend it and they're gonna kick it to the next budget cycle, the next budget cycle. So you've got that. You got asset managers looking over this small portfolio and saying, eh, I can't, it's hard to make a use case for that. And, and so they have the potential to slow it down or try it on a building or two. And then you've got, layers that a lot of people don't know exist, but they're like regional IT managers in a lot of these larger companies. And they can help push stuff along if they're on board with what you're doing. But again, they don't really have budgets to say, we're doing this for this amount of money. Ultimately, the property manager has an outsized influence to many decisions, many, many, many tech decisions. And unfortunately, a lot of them are not familiar with what the tech decisions are. They write RFPs, they get three responses, and they're just looking at price most of the time because they don't really understand the differences of those. So that's a real aspect on this side of the 
equation is sort of the outsized influence the property manager has and sometimes the chief engineer you know the, the chief engineer does have a budget and they do spend it on technology so you've got this sort of very disaggregated decision making and finding discovering each organization's real decision tree and what can really be accomplished is again like a first step when you're getting into a sale and not to be discouraged by it but just to learn about it and figure it out that's yeah. that's what i would encourage got you it to do. yeah that's that's week yeah. one of the the foundations course is the mapping out the stakeholders so last question thank you for kind of going a little bit longer today so last question um, this trend of all of these corporations making and REITs making long-term climate change commitments and mm -hmm. then the movement towards requiring certain ESG standards. How does yeah. that sort of play into all of this and trickle down to, say, an individual building or portfolio? It's ultimately, it's super positive because you are going to have to, at one point or another, address the deployment of these solutions across the board to achieve those goals. Like it's gonna have to happen. You know, the skepticism and the skeptic in me says, well, if it follows history, it's gonna get kicked and kicked and kicked until, you know, the timeline gets extended or they just have to slam something home to meet the, the need. And it, again, it, it doesn't really blossom the way that you, you would want it to. Um, you know, the, the optimist in me Pushing back is saying what's different from the past is you really do have hundreds of people that are talented, a lot of them venture backed, um, better capitalization with better targeting and an understanding of what they're going after, much, much better than we ever have. But the underlying talent pool is still small, but it's much, much stronger. And I do think that the opportunity to deliver and meet those timelines and actually kind of help it along in maybe fits and starts, but to, to get there. I do think it's the first time I can say like, it can be done. Mm. If you'd asked me like 10 years ago, I'd say there's no, there's no possible way. <laughs> right, right, so, yeah. That's exciting, that's exciting. Yeah, it does feel like there's quite a bit of momentum in that area, which Very much. You, you, there's a lot of bad news too happening, so you don't want to get too excited, but no, uh, exactly. it's definitely a good time to, to be in this, in this world. So, all right, yeah. Joe, I learned a lot. Thanks so hey, much. Thanks, man. And uh, anyone can reach out to Joe to learn more, I guess. So yeah. thanks a lot, Joe, and talk to you later. Thanks, All right, friends. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, please subscribe at nexus.substack.com. You can find show notes for this conversation there as well. As always, please reach out on LinkedIn with any thoughts on this episode. I'd love to hear from you. Have a great day.